welcome back. I got Karen Manchi on the line. Karen, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I am awesome. Uh, we've been waiting to do this for a while now because uh, we've both been experiencing this pandemic in interesting ways and have taken the opportunity to see what's going on in the world and, and actually take the time to write something about it. So tell us a little bit about your backstory. I know you're with Salesforce, but uh, also just you know, share with the audience your backstory a little bit and, and then we dive right into this book. And I know you got a new book. You just showed me the new book coming out on Tuesday. So we can and chat about that as well. So uh, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Well, thanks so much. You know, I was thinking back in preparation for our conversation and the first interview I ever did about working from home was in 2002. So it's true, I'm old. And also I like to say I was working from home before it was cool or coerced. <laughs> and what's fascinating is as my career progressed, you know, I stopped going into a traditional office. However, I still had that variety of flying and traveling to see customers and colleagues. And so when the pandemic was just starting to get real, I received this mysterious calendar invite. I don't know if this happens to you. It's like someone you know, and yet the subject of the meeting looks a little bit mysterious. Well, when I joined that conversation, there were fortunately a couple of colleagues who looked as confused as I was. And we were told that our mission was that we were now part of our company's work from home task force and our job was to help put really the infrastructure and operating model and resources in place to transition all of our employees simultaneously to work from home. And I thought, is that really going to happen? Do you remember you know, that time when it's like, oh, is that really going to happen? And I thought, isn't this interesting? I mean, I don't think about working from home or you know, building a distributed or virtual workforce as a core part of my skill set. And yet suddenly you know, past skills and experiences have present value for all of us. And so, you know, as we've taken some time to move forward, I mean, I had my own realization, I think kind of like you, which is a lot of people are struggling, you know, to adapt. And, you know, I've even found myself as much experience as I've had not being in an office, sometimes missing that variety and realizing it's taking something different to show up at my best personally and professionally. And that's really what inspired me to write this working from home, making the new normal work for you book in 30 days and brought it to market in less than 90 because I just heard constantly people saying, how can I live and work in a sustainable way? You know, how, how can I be at my best? Yeah, when you got assigned that task force that's on the job application or the contract that says other duties is assigned, well, it finally, <laughs> finally came true for you. You had the experience, um, and I think it was smart for that organization to lean on you and your colleagues that have been doing it to say, okay, there's the nuances of it. And many organizations that have switched to a working remotely model didn't have those nuances. They just said, okay, here we go. You're just going to do your work from over here. Well, not as easy as you think it is. Even with, you know, so everybody uses computers, it's not going to be a big deal. Okay, what about access the tools can we access everything that we can access internally some people don't have a printer at home and they print a lot of things okay let's talk about ergonomics of your desk do you have a desk at home do what, where are you working are you going to be working on your couch or on the floor or somewhere else you know i i imagine the physio claims are going through the roof if they're not now they will because i know so many people are working in very improper uh work settings as far as uh, working all day. So it's a big challenge for a lot of those people. But you and I have both seen, you know, some of the horror stories of what's going on right now with people working from home. And a lot of it is just for you and I who have done it a long time. We don't have to think about it. We just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to work from home today, or I'm going to be working from this location. And we adapt and we just continue on our way. But for many people, they've never worked from home before. And the nuances, the boss isn't walking by, my colleagues aren't here, my cat and dog are looking at me going, why are you here? There's all of these nuances that we've been facing. So you know, what, what are some of the discoveries that you found when you were talking with people and, and, and building this book out? 
Well, I was a little shocked and you might be too. I mean, 43% of people are working at home for the first time and that's people at every level in the organization. That means CEOs, that means chief HR officers. And in fact, I was doing a session recently with the CEO of a company and he's also now the COO of another organization. And he shared very candidly with the group, he said, you know, I've been a senior executive for a long time and I've never received any training in how to lead a workforce that I can't see. And he said, you know, what I think we need to understand is it isn't just, you know, individual contributors or salespeople who are used to being on the road and are suddenly at their homes or even first line managers. It's also senior leaders who are trying to make some decisions and even place some bets about the kinds of programs that people need in order to be successful and to figure out how to be an effective leader and in an entirely new context. And, you know, along the lines of what you mentioned, you know, so many of us are trying to sell for how do people feel more connected and how do we overcome these feelings of being isolated and invisible. And New Labs and FlexJob America did a study and what they discovered was 72% of people still do not have a dedicated workspace, like a place where work is happening that's dedicated. And within that 28.5% of people reported that they're working from bed. And so, you know, as leaders, we don't always see those things, right? I mean, the CEO of the company is not on a video call with every single person to say, wow, we need to start with this, right? The first level is, do people have a space to work? You know, to your point, do they have a comfortable chair and all of those things before we ever get into, you know, what, what video camera do you need or what audio setup do you need? It's like, do you have a space dedicated to work? And the other thing, you know, that I think we're all experiencing over time is what people need has changed. You know, at the beginning, it's how do we keep information safe? How do we keep people safe? And it was very adrenaline fueled. You know, it all happened so quickly. And, and the challenge with adrenaline is it wears off. And in phase two, the honeymoon is over, as I like to say, people started realizing, I mean, I can wear these stretchy clothes and wake up in my bed and instantly do work, never shower, go back to bed and do this again tomorrow. Is that me at my best? Maybe this isn't so glamorous. And so lots of companies, my own included, started rolling out, you know, some wellness programs, some things targeted around helping people have the tools, right, to make some changes. And now I think we're in this phase where people are asking, how long is this going to last? And while you and I certainly don't know the answer to that question, I think what's inherent within that is so many people and organizations are saying, hey, what we thought was gonna be temporary is becoming a little more permanent than we thought. And in light of that, how do we fundamentally rethink our culture and our values as an organization, how work gets done, how decisions get made, and what outcomes we're expecting people to deliver and really get some clear sense of priority so people don't have this feeling of, I'm doing everything I was doing before and more. It's what I like to call the great reset in a way because there's so many different aspects to things and we've seen you know, the rolling out of bed and starting working. That's why, you know, the, I think it was NordVPN that did the study that indicated that Americans are working on average 20% more hours. And at first I thought, wow, somebody finally found that 27 hour clock we've all wanted, but that's not the case. They traded their commute time to work time. And another pro tip, and I, and I share this whenever I get a chance, I, I tell people, Okay, if you're working in your sweats and t-shirt and all that stuff and you just have to put on a dress shirt or something for the Zoom calls and whatnot and you take it off when it's done, even though we, we're not sure when we're going to be going back to the office for many of us, some of them, who knows, maybe never, whatever never looks like. But I tell people, so from time to time, you're going to want to try on your work clothes because my concern is they're not going to fit because we haven't been as active. Uh, we don't walk around our office. We don't walk to and from our car or out into the parking lot or walk to go get lunch. Everything is pretty much contained within uh, you know, a few hundred square feet or maybe a couple thousand square feet, depending on the size of your home. But even then, you're not walking all throughout so our activity levels have lowered so there's a good chance that you know some of us may have put on a couple extra pounds and you don't want to go back into the office on monday morning get ready to 
you know, zip up the blouse or, you know, put on the slacks and go, hmm, not quite lining up here. Um, so occasionally try them on, and if they don't fit, well, then you've got time to make whatever adjustments, either buy bigger clothes or um, work, do the work that you need to do. But, you know, the, that stat that you said, you know, over 40% have never worked before, and everyone, it, it's just so different, everything. And, and, and even though we're we're still doing our same jobs, it's still different in how we do it. It's it, it's like you know, we're used to driving on this side of the road, and all of a sudden we're dropped off in the UK, and now we're on the other side of the road, and why is the steering wheel over here? It looks similar, but it's completely different. And from that aspect, it, it's so frustrating then toss in all the stressors, uh, working with you know our loved ones, our kids are there, and all of that. And then, of course, that question you had mentioned, it's like, when is this all going to be over? And I, I have my theories. I've, you know, I'm sure you have, too, you know, spoke with people that are in the know as far as science and pharma and all of that kind of stuff as to when we could potentially see a vaccine. And, you know, even if we get a vaccine, even if they said, okay, we have a new vaccine and it's ready to go. Okay. How are we going to inoculate 7 billion people? Is that going to happen overnight? No, uh, it, it's going to take a long time and it's going to have to be staged and all of that. Hopefully somebody's having conversations on how that's going to look, but my, my senses are maybe not so much. But at the end of the day, though, we're probably in this for a more of a, I don't want to say permanent, but a longer time frame than, than I think many of us thought back in the summer. Uh, so you know, what are some things that you're hearing organizations are doing to you know, come to grips with that and then say, okay, what do we need to do moving forward as if this is going to be a permanent situation for as long as we could see? I see organizations really trying to take this in very small pieces, starting with thinking about who is our customer now? Because something as fundamental as who you're serving may have shifted during this period of time. Right, your customer mix might have changed, your opportunity mix might have changed. And I think it starts there with who are we serving now? And within that experience, and I, I talk about this in, in Listen Up, how to tune into customers and turn down the noise that's coming out shipping on Tuesday. And in that question, you know, even if you're a long-standing business, a big business, a small business, within that could be an opportunity to find some new people to serve, some new opportunities, new routes to market. Next, after that, it's really being thoughtful about what are our values? You know, what is this per sense of purpose that, that we have that ties us to something bigger than just the customers or stakeholders that we might be serving, whether that's internal or external based on your role? And then really thinking in terms of what are the outcomes that we are prioritizing delivering in light of both of those things, what we value and who we serve. And taking a pause to be purposeful about that kind of says, let's take what we might do in a strategic planning cycle for a year or a three to five year horizon. And let's do that a little bit more quickly so we can make some quick adjustments and then follow that through with being very clear around messaging of those outcomes of ownership as a tool to help people know where to focus. So I hear and observe and experience a lot of people asking that big impact question, you know, who is our customer now? And then also really thinking about what are the outcomes? The last piece of that, you know, once you've sort of figured that out and reassessed, organizations are really thinking about what other engagement tools and programs do we need to put in place to help people be at their best as they're delivering those, maybe a little in the office, maybe a little bit at home, maybe flexing between the two, depending on your organization. And thinking through the different levels of, you know, what tools do we need? You mentioned the printer, that's such a big battleground, right? Strangely enough, but you know, what do we need actually from an infrastructure perspective? What do we need from a collaborative perspective? What do we need in terms of the decision-making structure and process? And then, you know, ultimately, how are we gonna reward and celebrate that success? Because there aren't big events where people are walking across stages and getting trophies, right? So how do we also be thoughtful then about aligning some of the rewards and recognition to help you know, combat those feelings of being invisible and isolated. That's great. And I think that it gives me some hope that organizations are looking and asking that question. Okay, who are 
the customers that we serve now? Has it changed? And are we communicating with those customers to ask them, what do you need from us now? We're all big on, well, here's this. We're going to roll out this three-year project on this endeavor. We're going to get your CRM all set up, and you're going to be able to follow up with your customers and all of that good stuff, which is crucial and important because I'm not, I know I'm preaching in the choir here. Follow-up is a big deal if you want to be successful in business. I mean, your, your organization's all about that. Uh, but so many organizations right now, are looking so much within that sometimes they might be forgetting to look and say, okay, what do our customers actually need right now? And what do we need to do in order to be able to deliver those things? And and so it's giving me hope that there are organizations that are asking those questions because they're realizing, okay, we can't just sit here and wait um, because then our business is just going to decline to the point of being, you know, out of business completely. So let's let's do some things and figure that out. So in, in wrapping up, what are some things that you are seeing that are surprising? And that might be one of those things, you know, the customer feedback, but what are a couple other things that you're seeing that organizations and, and or individuals are doing to successfully navigate through this working from home situation? Because there's a lot of people that aren't doing well with it and any, anything we can give them to you know, give them hope and courage and some ideas to make it a little bit easier for them. I think it'd be great. So what are some things you're observing when it comes to that? My two biggest observations have been around crowdsourcing and community. And think about those in kind of a different context. Crowdsourcing has become an opportunity to say, everyone in the organization has some kind of skill or talent that might have been hidden to us that's suddenly relevant. And organizations that are high performers right now and are being agile and adaptive are tapping into the skills their employees have and putting those to use in new ways. One example that comes to mind, Twitter decided that it would be a great idea to be able to tap into basically managers at the same level who aren't in the same part of the organization coming together to be able to do little micro training moments for each other, right? Perhaps you're fantastic with collaborative tools, Maybe I'm great at how to have nutritious food available so you can leave your desk, go grab it and come back. They sort of viewed that all skills were relevant right now and therefore invited people in very small, fun increments. And I'm talking five to 10 minutes to share those learnings. The other piece, and this doesn't have to be, by the way, on the crowdsourcing, a big, you know, expensive five-phase training program where people get certifications. It's tap into what are the biggest needs and who are the people in your organization that could fill those. Then the second piece is community. So the organizations that are doing really well are acknowledging that people are feeling isolated and invisible and wanting connection. You know, people miss the camaraderie of the office. They also miss being able to illustrate in a more tangible way, to your point, being able to show your manager how hard you're working, which to some degree, a lot of people associate with being in person. And so as people are feeling, you know, kind of isolated and disconnected, the longer this is going, uh, many organizations that are really helping their employees be well and keep delivering and feel a sense of being connected are finding ways to put together communities of interest, you know, whether that's around hobbies, whether that's around business topics, whether that's around career development, and giving people a chance to opt into something that they want to join as a means to find something in common with someone else and also be seen and heard, which is fundamentally what we all want. Those are some great examples and can be done in a variety of different skills, but I do like the the approach of, okay, we're just gonna do this little 10 minute session on how to do this. And no, there's no certificate unless you want me to draw something on a post-it note and I'll mail it to you. There you go. There's your certificate. Good job, Johnny. You know, keep up the good work. But again, I, there's so many little, and I say little, but they're subtle, but they're huge and they're important changes. Uh, when you nearly half the population has never worked remotely before. And all of a sudden here we all are. And we're told, okay, six feet apart you know, losing the interaction of even a fist bump or a high five or a hug or anything like that. All of those things have been missing from us. And I think from a psychological standpoint, it's going to be interesting to see what the long-term impact of this will be when it comes to 
the you know the mental well-being so those great organizations are doing everything they can to get ahead of it now before it becomes a huge problem down the road for sure very much so and it's you know this is a time to really think about how to accept you know accept where we are accept the circumstances that we're in then be able to adapt right and tapping into some of these micro training moments and visibility opportunities really help with the last part, which is accelerate. Great. It's, I, I tell people, especially with those that are burning out, it's like, well, focus on the things you can do. There's still things you can do and do those and make sure you're doing a couple things every week that you really enjoy doing. It brings you joy and fulfillment and happiness. It helps navigate through these interesting times for sure. So Karen, I've loved this conversation. Congratulations on the, the books, you know, plural, and, and good luck with the new one as well. So where can people find out more about you and this incredible work you're doing? Thank you. Yes, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. I blog regularly on Thrive Global and ZDNet. And the books, uh, you'll find three books that I've written, all available on Amazon. And I'll have links to all of that information in the show notes. So Karen, thank you again for the work you do. Um, it's, it's critical and desperately needed in times like these. So thank you for uh, taking the time of, you know, of your life and writing books. I know that even though you got one out pretty quickly, that still, it took a lot of time and concentrated deep work to be able to get the work done. But I appreciate uh, the works that you've put out and I look forward to, you know, keeping in touch and, and seeing more of the stuff that you put out. Thank you so much. And I look forward to reading yours when it comes out as well. I know it's a, it's a big undertaking. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. You too.